Thank you, everybody. You can hear me okay with this microphone? Yes. All right. I'm going to put you all on the spot. I'm going to ask you to give me a number out of 0 to 10 on where the media is in terms of crisis, with 0 being, hey, everything's okay, to 10 being danger, danger, Will Robinson. Um, and then a quick explanation as to why. And we'll start with John. Thanks, Karen. And thank you, everybody, for attending tonight. It's, uh, it's a real honour to be here tonight. Um, look, I, I would put it at uh, around about a three. And the reason I say that is that I think there are challenges. I'm always nervous about the use of the word crisis prematurely, but I do think there are challenges. And when you compare with what's happening around the world, I'll be very quick, but when you compare with what's, what's happened around the world in the past, when in illiberal countries, authoritarian regimes, what's done to journalists, which is appalling, I don't think it's fair for us to think that Australia is anywhere like that, but we do have challenges and I know we'll talk about those tonight. Uh, I'm probably going to go firmly on the fence and say maybe a five. I agree with what John said that we don't have anywhere near some of the challenges that um, uh, journalists, media, organisations, media full stop um, have in other countries, in other jurisdictions, but we do have a, a problem with trust in the media at the moment, I think, an increasing problem with trust in the media. That's a bit of a crisis point. We are shrinking. We're diversifying, but we're also shrinking at the moment. Media, um, your main newspapers, your, your different media outlets, traditional media outlets are shrinking. Others are, are starting up and, and filling some of that space, but some of our traditional media is, is shrinking, is, is starting to die, and we need to make sure it doesn't. I would say it's a seven. Uh, I'd say that the warning signs are most definitely flashing amber. I think uh, this is the, the worst time um, probably in the last 40 years for defamation law in this country. And over the last 20 years, we've seen the federal government erect uh, a profoundly invasive security state that uh, now has the powers to comprehensively crack down on journalism when it wants to. And we've seen in recent times that it has wanted to. So uh, I, I'm pessimistic, in fact. Well, you stole my line there too, Ben. Um, I would say definitely a seven. I agree with absolutely everything Ben has said. I think it's disgraceful that the New York Times is writing about the fact that Sydney is the defamation capital of the world. Um, our defo laws prevent us investigative journalists doing our job because anybody can sue you for defo, whether you've told the truth or not, and that makes makes life very difficult. Uh, we're somewhat protected at Michael West because we do go after corporate malfeasance, bank um, bastardry, if you like. Uh, we go after the big end of town. At this stage, corporates can't sue, uh, but the New South Wales government, no doubt egged on by their donors, is trying to change that so that corporates can sue, and that'll be the death of journalism I, as I see it in this country. All right, so Heidi, let's talk about this topic Let's of the you can't handle the truth. Your audience um, is never shy, of, uh, never backward about coming forward. When they see uh, journalist homes being ransacked, when they see uh, the ABC computers being ransacked, when they hear about uh, the you know, metadata laws, when there's you know that kind of discussion about the media, what's their response? What are they telling you? They don't care an awful lot, to be perfectly honest with you. They really don't. It's one of those stories that's very much of great interest to people in the media and big consumers of the media. But I think ordinary Australians, to use a Scott Morris, Morrisonism, the quiet Australians couldn't give two hoots. Don't care. Um, I watched with fascination like everybody else the the raids on the the ABC computers and it's like, this cannot be happening there must be huge outrage for this open the talk back lines the next morning not a peep it doesn't it doesn't resonate much outside of the the media circles the media interest areas but Ben Eltham there's plenty of grist for the mill it's not just the attack on the media it's uh, they don't care seemingly about the kind of ministerial responsibility. You know, uh, Mick Young, famously in the 1970s from the ALP, failed to declare a Paddington Bear when he came back into the country and had to step down until there was an investigation. And yet here we are with 
an extraordinarily long list of ministers or backbenchers or ministers who are now backbenchers, you know, it, you know getting your lover a, an office in a, a, a job, you know, a job in an office, um, internet bills going into tens of thousands of dollars. Why don't they care about those stories? Because that's their money. It's absolute hubris by these politicians. Why don't people care about that? It's a really good question, Karen. I, I can't myself tell you why ordinary citizens don't care about corruption in government, but I think part of it's to do with an erosion of trust in general throughout our society in institutions over the last generation, and I think we've seen an erosion of trust not just in parliamentary politics, not just in the media itself, but in a range of institutions. You know, churches have been embroiled in devastating abuse scandals. We've seen uh, a diminution of scientific trust, you know, when uh, issues like climate change have become politicised. Uh, and so I think that feeds into a general disillusionment where people just expect politicians to be a little bit corrupt, I think. I just don't think they really are surprised. Um, you know, I personally am a bit surprised. Like, I was um, genuinely shocked when Stuart Robert was put in charge of the National Disability <laughs> Insurance Scheme. Um, you know, he, he'd previously been sacked by Malcolm Turnbull for um, falling foul of the Ministerial Code of Conduct for accepting gifts um, as part of basically... Um, you know, irregular lobbying while on the job. So, you know, I thought this was probably not the best guy to be looking after a multi-billion dollar uh, institution. But, but you know, yeah, that does the average citizen um, have much of a view on that? I, I don't think they do. Sandy, why do you think that these scandals keep propping up and nothing happens? There's certainly a degree of hubris from the politicians who basically say, I'm untouchable. You've been in the business a long time. You've witnessed a lot of um, comings and goings. Any thoughts on why it's just not resonating? I think it's just the public are just so over it. They're not listening. They don't care. They, they've just thrown them all into the, into the same uh, barrel and said, you know, damn the lot of them, basically. The only thing that has given me any encouragement recently is a bloke by the name of Jordan Shanks, Friendly Geordies. Geordie, anyone heard of him? Yes? Anybody else subscribe to his videos or been to his shows? Uh, I happened to watch the one that he did on the federal election and then I just suddenly looked at the number of hits and I rang Westy and I said, Jesus, this guy's had over 200,000 hits. You know, and then I started doing some research and Crikey had written an article just a couple of weeks ago say he's had over 50 million views. Now, he talks about politics and the economy and he's bloody good. He's, a, you know, one of those... He's in his 20s. He's actually a comedian, but he talks about all this serious stuff. And uh, I went along his... He did a show travelling around Australia and it was sold out everywhere. So he's doing a repeat show, that's sold out. So he's, been, he's doing add-ons. I keep getting Facebook updates to say, oh, there'll be another one, there'll be another <coughs> one uh, here in Melbourne. And I went along. I was clearly the oldest person in the room. Um, <laughs> and I, I just... I almost had tears in my eyes just looking around seeing all these young people. And I thought, great. We've all turned off. We've had enough. We don't care anymore. But they do. And I think, and we'll see tomorrow with the kids' to, uh, climate strike. So I think let them, you know, go, guys. Terrific. So that's, uh, that's actually did cheer me up somewhat. <laughs> John, it's unfortunate you're kind of the only politico in the room, so you've got to get a pinky from us. Uh, we can that's all right. Um, you know, one of the real issues, too, is the <clears> fact <throat> that um, politicians consistently tell untruths. And it's not just Trump and it's not just Boris Johnson in our own governments. Um, you know, the state election campaign where uh, your side of politics ran a pretty aggressive law and order crime campaign, which was a bit disingenuous. When you're in the middle of it, you know, can do you understand what's going on? Can you see that some of this stuff is just not right? It's, you know, the inflating some of the crime figures and the like? Oh, well, we, we were very scrupulous in the crime figures. You can have a debate about them. I'm sure there are many different views about them, but we always made sure whatever assertions... Crime we... tsunami? Well, I mean, yeah. 
it didn't work. The result is the result, right? <laughs> Clearly the people spoke and... and um, but look, it's about how accountable the system can make politicians. And one of the real um, dilemmas we're facing now, I think as Heidi was saying before, you have a, in many ways a diversified or ramified media market now. So when Mick Young resigned uh, you know, three or four decades ago, for those of us who were there, I was much younger, but you know, that was the story. It dominated the only um, platforms of media, which are radio and TV, basically, weren't they? So a story could gather traction. Today, uh, a story or a controversy might run for a little bit, you know, on the 5 or 6 a.m. bulletin. By 11 a.m., we're on to something else. But can I just say something to give people heart that not the media is not... Um, uh, not diminishing as a potent force in our democracy. If you look at just a few, I was just jotting a few things down um, as I was thinking about this. Royal Commission into Banks, a lot of media were behind that, but you'd have to give the age a gold star for the work it did on that. The Child Abuse Inquiry, your network, the ABC, in particular Paul Kennedy, did a lot of work which led to major reforms on that. Lawyer X and the Silk Miller IBAC investigation. You'd have to give marks to the Herald Sun, particularly Anthony Dowsley, who drove that. Fines Vic, I'll give you one, Heidi. Uh, you know, and, and Neil Mitchell, um, some credit there. Fines Vic, that was something you pushed. You weren't the only ones, but you led it. So media is doing some really important work. And in the midst of all this, it might just be salutary to remember that there's some really good stuff that the media is doing and that has a real impact. Now, to the point about accountability... You know, you couldn't say any of those haven't led to some really intense accountability of politicians. And that's what the system has to do. And let's pick up on that, because I know this is something you want to talk about too, um, Heidi, in terms of, you know, some of the ministers who are on your various programs um, and the, the, the lack of accountability or able to talk over and explain what seem to be some pretty onerous and awful things that some of their colleagues are doing. Um, again, are, are you having the problems where you're... Listeners just don't care. Oh no, they'll they'll care if there's a um, if we have a politician in. You're asking them some fairly pointed questions, and you're not getting any sort of detailed answers. That happens Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every day. Um, that angers people when they're hearing the questions being asked. The perfectly reasonable, sensible questions that all of us would ask if we had the opportunity have to have this person sitting in front of them. And when, there's, um, when they obfuscate, when they avoid the question, when they deliberately not answer, when they use just pat sets of answers over and over again, um, that irritates people. That irritates people a lot. But um, my issue more with the ministerial responsibility and accountability, government accountability, that sort of thing, is not many people will front up for those sort of interviews anymore. They won't come sit down in the studio and do that sort of interview because it's easier to um, <coughs> govern by tweet or govern by press release or govern by um, slick Facebook video um, and Insta story. Like, <coughs> you need to be able to apply some scrutiny. You need to be able to um, forensically examine a, a promise or a commitment or a, uh, an issue, um, a, a, a tribunal decision, a, a, a report to parliament. You need a, a bit of legislation that's being drafted up that um, you want your crossbenchers, say, in the upper house who'll decide legislation. You want to know that they're detail specific on it, and they're really not. But the opportunities to, to get those people in front of you, to ask those questions and to get those answers, they're drying up. They really are. Uh, it's easier to do it by, by, by Facebook video, by Twitter, by whatever, by um, quick media conference, five questions inside. Or, and, and the media yeah. um, inquiries that could be put in the email and then give you an unusable quote and you know five files of background that it's just like yep. yes. you're obligated to do it because you've asked them for it, but it's absolute nonsense. Send you a statement that comes nowhere near no. any of the questions no, you asked, absolutely. and so you send them back another email yeah. and they send back another, you know, they're back and forward. I still don't have an answer to many of those things. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not the only one, Karen. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> so, Ben, what's driving the raids on journalists? What's driving the clampdown on freedoms and these ever-intrusive metadata laws and, and this ill? What's driving it? Well, federal politicians have driven it. They've passed something like 67 national <coughs> security bills since 2001. So um, if you want to know who's responsible, it's pretty clear, actually. It's the people sitting but in Parliament. What are their motivations? Well, I think there's a national security establishment in Canberra um, that has been very successful in getting their view across to the politicians 
I also think that the bipartisanship of national security legislation between the Labor and Liberal parties has meant we've had very little independent scrutiny of many of these bills. Indeed, many of them are in fact locked up in the Parliamentary Joint Intelligence and Security Committee where a lot of the testimony is secret, so we don't even hear what ASIO, what the DSD have to say, you know, so we don't exactly know what the spooks are doing. Um, and, you know, <coughs> the fact is, um, if you look at, at what's been done over the last 15 years, we've erected the machinery that would allow the federal government, if it, if it chose, to, to basically run a security state. You know, there's the laws there enable the security apparatus to crack down if they want to, and we've started to see that happening. Um, so I think it is deeply concerning, for example, that at the moment we've got a secret trial going on, a, literally a secret trial of a whistleblower mm -hmm. from inside Australia's <laughs> intelligence system. This is a fellow who blew the whistle on Australia spying on the government of East Timor, not spying for national security reasons either, spying for commercial <coughs> reasons in order to get more oil and gas for Woodside. That's a pretty rum reason to spy on a neighbour, I think, and when that was revealed, that person and his lawyer are now both in a secret trial in court. And I think that's deeply concerning in a, in a country that calls itself a liberal democracy. So we've got a, a bit of a, a real problem with press freedom. So Sandy, have we got a branding issue or an image problem for press freedom? But do people not understand what, what it is? Um, you know, there's not really the press anymore. Do they think that press freedom means um, that you're free to do whatever you want? Um, is there a problem with the idea of press freedom? Are we not selling it properly, explaining it properly? I've thought about this problem and I, to be honest, I haven't been able to really put my finger on what the problem is. I, other than saying I think people are just so disenchanted by politics that they're no longer interested and so they don't read um, newspapers the way, um, you know, we used to absorb all our news through newspapers. Now it's all on Facebook or it's on um, Instagram. Uh, but, you know, people are using different, different forms of social media. But I, I know just talking to my son's friends, um, they, they just, most of them have just switched off, basically. Uh, so how do, and so the, the last thing they're interested in is, you know, is what's happening to the media. And you say, you know, because of Google and Facebook sort of swallowing up all the advertising, taking it away from the media, the thousands of journalists are, are losing their jobs. We've lost, you know, the, art, <coughs> the old frank and fearless um, journalism. We, you'd spend days and weeks rather than minutes and hours investigating uh, you know, that's, that's become almost unaffordable now. Uh, so the, the stories aren't... I, I, I think if the stories aren't getting out there, uh, we're not picking <coughs> enough interest. So we need more, certainly need <coughs> more investigative journalism. I worry, I worry about the internet and I think it's absolutely awash with opinion. And who the hell cares about it? Because if you want opinion, go on to Twitter. It's all there. Um, and so I think people turn off because of that. But I think if we got back to good, old-fashioned investigative journalism, people would start taking interest. They'd say, oh, hey, that, good job. Well done. I, I'm so glad that you've, you've raised this. You've exposed this. This has really helped me. You know, um, but how do we do that? Because I know we struggle at Michael West. There's there's just the two of us there, um, but we rely on public donations. But there's no there's no sort of funding business model that you know that to to fund this type of journalism. I was going to talk about about uh, not for profit journalism, but perhaps later. Yeah, yeah. We'll um, and how out. important that is in you know in a, in uh, the US. <laughs> I think that it's really important this, um, you know, we've got this splintering of the media, and I'm going to put this to John, um, that I was chatting to a, a friend of mine who's a, a former pollster who uh, was giving me some insight into, you know, what went wrong in the various elections or all getting it so wrong. But one of the points he was making was that there used to be mainstream media and there used to be mainstream opinions. Now you've got this diverted, div you know, very divided media 
and therefore opinions and lots of feel opinions and the like. So when you, when you, from a, a political perspective, how do, do you actually know that that's what's going on? How, did you know, for example, have, have um, your party known about these kinds of things behind the scenes, that the polls were completely wrong and people are not understanding issues in the same way? So when they're responding and we think it was the climate change election and it's not, is that something that's understood within the political sphere? There are two answers, um, uh, so, uh, before and after. And the after answer is yes, we knew. There's <laughs> um, always a bit of that. Look, to be fair to the PM, I think the PM did you know, know that. He was on record. And look, talking from my side of politics, not a partisan thing. He called thing. it a miracle. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't know. <laughs> but, Sorry. Um, no, 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 that, that's uh, very true. Um, uh, you know, there were a few people who thought there was a pathway, but it was very narrow. And um, the problem with polls, and, and we need polls. Everybody wants them. We all want them because we want to know what's the best gauge of where we're at, how things are going. Uh, I certainly worked on the campaign and you could feel something was going on, particularly in the sort of last couple of weeks in particular, and it, and it wasn't so much climate change, the tax issue in my view. We all got different opinions, <coughs> I'm sure, but my view was, was probably the tax stuff started to come through and, and people started to centre on what that would mean for them. But I, I think pollsters now are, I think it's one of those arts now that um, people understand it and they kind of not intentionally game it, but they might for one reason not give a candid answer to a pollster about what they're really intending to do. They want to give an answer which they think might be politic to give because they might not want to, you know, mm. alienate the I pollster. Or, you know, and, yeah, and, and, and that might work both ways. The traffic could run both ways. So. As much as we're going to continue to rely on polling, it's not going to go away. We'll try to perfect it and improve it. But I think the public now is savvy to it and reacts in certain ways. But, but as for the federal election, it, you know, that's interesting because I have to sit here honestly and say, did I see in the state election the tsunami that came my way and the way of my colleagues? I, I didn't see that. I, I, you know, I had views about what the outcome was going to be and it was probably going to be, in my view, a fairly status quo. I prayed for, uh, you know, a, a miracle, but um, <laughs> like we all were, but I sort of sensed that. I never saw that. So you can have elections where you just got no idea about that. But with the federal election, certainly the, in, the internal polling, I don't mind saying this now, the internal polling always had it, you know, fairly close and it was very nerve-wracking, but it was never out of the ballpark to win from, from my side's perspective. Um, as for the pollsters, I think, you know, it just gets a momentum of its own and um, then everybody wants to feel like that they're with the major opinion, as I think you were saying in the question. Um, Heidi, so it's not just governments, politicians, ministers who are trying to keep the uh, media from doing its job. Um, Victoria Police has an extraordinary reputation right now um, for trying to block all manner of information. The lawyer ex-Royal Commission that's going on into police informers uh, is almost um, unreportable. Um, and, you know, you understand on some levels that there has to be some kind of operational protections, but then, you know, they wanted to gag the coronial inquiry into James Gargas Mullis, the fellow who drove down and killed six people in Burke Street, and, you know, the 12 hours that led to that, where the police were touching him the whole way, and um, the recent Tanya Day coronial inquiry, the Indigenous woman who died in police custody, where they put up a clearly... A, a person who was not able to answer any of the questions that the coroner was going to do. So we've actually got a real problem with our police force as well. What are your thoughts? Well, there was a fight too with that coronial inquest, wasn't there, about releasing the video from Absolutely. the police cell yes. as well? Yes. They, they fought yes. every step of the way on a, a bunch of these things. Mm -hmm. The Gaga Sulis issue, right through, um, they haven't wanted to release anything. And in fact, the coroner had to finally rule um, no, you have to release it. Come on. Um, the lawyer ex um, Royal Commission, the Royal Commissioner, the Commissioner has whacked police several times on it, um, them not providing documents. And the thing I think that's sometimes forgotten about the lawyer ex thing um, is that. Uh, there were several internal investigations for years. The Victoria Police ran several different internal investigations and they still didn't know when the Attorney General called the Royal Commission that um, Nicola Gobbo had been on the books for a lot longer until they discovered a document months later kept in some warehouse in, I don't know, Footscray or something. Um, how, do you, how has that happened all the way through? Have they really been looking 
Did any of those internal investigations really look that closely? We're supposed to accept that they looked, didn't find anything. Um, the Commission's running a lot longer than it was originally set down to do. Um, the sheer amount of money that police are spending on lawyers and on police resources, um, trying to fight, trying to block, trying to stall this, all of these three things, it's a big number. It's an astronomical number. I don't know if we'll ever quite know the, that full number. It is uh, staggering and pretty frightening that they're trying to keep just this much secret. We hope that the courts, we hope that the commissioner, we hope that they're compelled to, to give everything. I hope someone else is checking the warehouse where the documents are kept. I'll go look. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Give us a couple of days. We'll find a lot. Um, ben, so it's not, um, you know, Victoria has a reputation as the suppression state in Australia, though I was on a panel with a couple of um, judges recently who said, oh, no, no, that's so not true. It's like, I'll come down my email, uh, you know, box every day and see how many come through. And the suppressions, we're supposed to be given three days' notice, we're supposed to be able to fight them, and they just come through as a matter of course. A defence lawyer just goes in and decides he wants a suppression and it's always granted immediately. There might be a hearing, but um, very rarely anything happens. Um, FOI laws are being abused, you know. If, if you're able to get anything out of freedom of information, it might be heavily redacted or there might be a huge cost to it. These are the kinds of imposts that are also... What impact is that having on doing investigative good journalism? Yeah, I think it, there's no doubt that it's getting harder to do investigative journalism. Um, the legal challenges are more difficult. Um, the technological challenges, um, in some ways, are more difficult. Even though technology has helped journalism in some respects, it's also helped government to hide things uh, with a, a lot more, um, a lot more alacrity, if you like. So I think that that's a problem. Um, you know, but we just don't have as many investigative journalists as we used to. You know, and and I think so that. It means there's just not as many people out there looking for stories. But I think we also need to... Um, we, we, all, we, we often in the media get hung up on investigative journalism and Watergate and washing old copies of all the president's men. And, you know, and that's great and that's lovely. But uh, there's a whole bunch of things that the media does that are not sexy and that are not particularly going to win you a, a journalism prize or a Walkley, but are super important. And if you want to see where the media is really, really falling away with the cuts to funding and with you know the, the changes with, with the internet coming in and print dying off, it's in local news. And we've got a local news desert now in many places in Australia where we just don't have uh, people covering local government. Uh, in many cases, we, we now have very few people covering state governments. Mm. You know, so, um, you know, academics are now talking about a coming golden age of local government corruption, basically, because there's, there's very little scrutiny of some of the things that are going on in, in some of these, um, you know, in, in many small towns in Australia. Sandy, of course, you know um, full well that there are lots of different ways that uh, journalists can be suppressed. We need to be a bit careful talking about uh, this next issue, but tell us about... Uh, what ordinary individuals can do to stop coverage of their stories. Okay, so this is a now a first in Australia. It's happened in Victoria. Uh, I don't know, has anyone heard of personal safety intervention orders? Uh, these are domestic violence orders. They're called different names in different states. Personal safety intervention order. Um, now these orders are now being used to gag journalists. Uh, the couple of cases <coughs> happening at the moment, uh, the way those orders were obtained, and it's very, very easy, are uh, you simply rock up to the local magistrate court. Two things you need to say. You need to say that that journalist has been threatening you, and if you've got a child, good, been threatening the kid as well. That goes over well. And then you say you've been suffering uh, incredible stress, being suicidal, even tried suicide. You will get a, an instant interim order on the spot. Okay? Now, I believe this happened because a couple of years back, uh, a, there was a woman in the courts, one of the magistrates' courts in Victoria, trying to get an interim order and she was denied that order because she didn't have enough 
evidence, etc., and that night she was killed by her partner. So now they're very worried about that, so they'll issue them instantly. The sort of people who might try to use these orders are generally the sort of person who is trying to avoid media scrutiny. Uh, they're often people who are fraudsters, who are, you know, um, who think nothing of telling lies in court. So this is now what is happening. So for the journalist, if you've been doing an investigation against that person, you have two options if you want to fight it. Well, it's a very lengthy, incredibly expensive process. It will take you 12 to 18 months to fight it and cost you between ten and $15,000. There are no costs. So when you get to the final case and you ask them, it's called further and better particulars, to produce their evidence that you've threatened them, and of course they can't, unless they bring in a crimi mate who lies to the court, which they often do as well, um, you, you, you can't claim costs. So, so you don't even get costs. Furthermore, if you decide that you're going to cop it and not go through that process, because most, in most cases, what's going to happen to the story? It's old. It's old hat. It's yesterday's news. So it just gets filed. So they cop it. And by copying it means that that person can then go back having got the final order because you didn't, you didn't uh, defend it, uh, then they can have everything you've ever written about them wiped off the internet. Facebook, all the, all the articles that you've published, any tweeting that you've done on the subject, everything gets wiped. What is it in view of the courts, though? I mean, you're going to go to courts. I am. It's a very dim view. Well, I don't Sorry. think we'll, I think we'll I don't think it's in, a, in, a think in, the, in the Q and A. But I think the problem is they haven't Sorry. they haven't actually understood how it's going to affect digital media. I mean, the Personal Safety Intervention Act actually says that a final a final order may not be uh, um, issued if that person was going about their normal job including a journalist doing a news story. So it actually says that. So that's, that's the defence. But you have to wait for 12 to 18 months to come back and say, because it, basically, should they have been issued? No, I don't think so in the first place. So, John, um, is national security the cover for political insecurity? Well, I certainly <laughs> hope not, and it shouldn't be. And I think, it for me, like it though, well, like this, this, is the, this is the debate we've got to have because what I'm concerned about in the aftermath of the raids recently is that I think we really need a discussion about where is the proper and sensible intersection between <coughs> the need to classify information, of any government to classify information with press freedom. Um, I don't think there's anybody that, I, that I've encountered anywhere in the debate or in person who believes that press freedom is not a cardinal benefit, a cardinal strength of our democracy. Everybody wants to protect it. What we haven't really discussed is what justifications and what parameters do you want to place around the need to classify? Now, you can start at either end and you can say press freedom, cardinal principle. Classification, yeah, in some cases... You've got to classify information, if for no other reason, to protect agents in the field or protect genuine national interests. But we get in this massive grey zone where there's room <laughs> for argument. And so I would hope that we're not over shooting the runway on the need to classify things. And I, what I hope, as a result of the inquiry that's now underway into uh, the ability of law enforcement agencies to conduct raids or execute warrants... Uh, against media organisations and journalists. What I hope will come out of that is a fairly robust assessment of, well, are we getting that balance right? And it may well be that we're not. Maybe, maybe we're classifying things that really do we need to classify them? Can we improve processes? So before um, you know, a, a, a story is going to run and it's, there's a genuine public interest, the media organisation backs it, uh, are there procedures in place where 
you know, if authorities really have a genuine view, it can be sorted out as promptly as possible. I'm not sure we've exhausted those possibilities so that things can be worked out with a perspective that favours the release of information, but where there are genuine reasons. I don't think we've actually sorted that out. And that's a, I've got to confess, that's a difficult subject to broach because you do, to some extent, have to rely on law enforcement agents not only agents, but the agencies themselves who are going to give advice to governments and to parliaments about, well, look, there's a genuine need to classify this. There's a genuine need to keep this secret. If, if it doesn't, then people could be in danger, or whatever it is, as long as it's a genuine reason. What can tend to happen, and it's not just in the, you know, it's not just in the national security field. As a lawyer, it happened in other fields, I remember, where sometimes we are overly cautious and impose conditions or um, set the parameters beyond what we can really live with. And when we, over, when we overstep that, in the case of national security, we really are <coughs> encroaching on, on press freedom in a big way. So that's the discussion we need to have, and that's what I hope will come out of that inquiry. Heidi, you uh, off the top talked about trust. We've got to build trust. Um, I think politicians do. I think um, uh, journalists do as well. How do we do that, though? How do we go about rebuilding the brand and rebuilding trust? There you go. Oh, God. <laughs> Uh, well, um, my five-point plan would be. No, I don't, Vote one I don't know. I don't know. All we can, all, all we do every day is is plug away at um, the story, at the interview, at the angle, at the improving some transparency, some accountability, informing our audience of um, whatever it is that's going on, um, and we do it to the the best of our ability. We do it hand on heart. We do it honestly. We. I don't know any journalist who's lying or faking things. I, we're not I'm fake not news. I don't, I don't um, but but publishing do things every day together? or printing things every day. Do we day. need to come together? Do we need to actually start um, you know, being much more of a block rather than competitors when it comes to dealing with this? There are some, uh, like there's the Right to Know Coalition, which is bringing together the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance and other organisations that lobbies government constantly. But... You know, do we need to start saying in, in the press gallery in Canberra, for example, OK, well, given that this has happened, we're not going to do something like that, where we actually hold um, politicians to account when this kind of thing is happening, when we're being pushed like this? Yeah, I would like to see that happen. I think that's possibly one, one way to at least start it. How, we, how do we restore politics... Uh, how do we restore trust and, and faith in politics? I don't know if that's ever possible to do, but maybe that's a, maybe that's a solution for, for journalists to all work together. I know um, back when I used to work on the state rounds and we'd be at a press conference, if one of us is, is following a, a set of questions and not getting, the, um, not getting the answers, everyone would pile on and keep asking the same question until we got to a point where the minister, the, the shadow minister, whatever, would walk off or um, finally answer it. What a miracle. Um, yeah, so more of that on a large scale, sure. Try anything, I guess. Ben, if nobody cares about the media, are we superfluous to society? No. <laughs> no, sadly, um, we're not superfluous to society. Uh, a democratic society does actually need a mechanism for finding out things about the world around us because if there isn't a way for people to find things out about who's in charge, about who has the power, whether that be government power, whether that be corporate power, then um, they're, they're going to be at a substantial information asymmetry, you might say. Like, they're going to be at a big disadvantage compared to the people who have the power. But um, I'd, I'd also inject a note of caution or perhaps even a bit of devil's advocacy here, which is that we often get into these discussions in the media and it becomes a bit of a loving where the, the media is like this wonderful organ that holds society to account, holds a mirror up to society, you know, about? Holds, <laughs> holds governments to account. You know, the media is a powerful industry in its own right. It's a largely self-regulated industry. Uh, it's shown time and again that it's prepared to abuse its power for its own interests. You only have to look at the Leveson inquiry in the United Kingdom. That was only eight years ago. Uh, there's plenty of examples in Australia where the media has served our democracy rather poorly, in my opinion. I think the reporting on climate change collectively over the last 20 years has demonstrably been poor in the way that it's presented climate change as some kind of debate, when of course it's not scientifically, there's no debate at all. Um, and you can look at a number of different areas where powerful media organisations have pursued what are overtly their own corporate interests um, 
rather than reporting the news in, in a um, you know bipartisan or, or in a, in a non-biased fashion. So I, I think we need to be careful when we talk about these kind of things about putting the media media up on a pedestal as you know the only institution that can. Uh, you know, speak truth to power. Actually, ordinary citizens have a lot more ability to do that themselves through social media. And if you want to look at some of the recent social media campaigns in recent years, some of them have been very effective at getting governments to take notice, at holding governments to account when the media hasn't necessarily been that good. And I think one good example would be around RoboDebt, for example, uh, the government's online compliance initiative in welfare payments. That was really driven by social media activists um, and citizen journalists in the first instance. It was only after about a year or so that the mainstream media picked that up. And, um, you know, and, and still, of course, the government hasn't done anything about that. So I think that we need to have a nuanced perspective about this stuff. Sandy, content is king. That you know, there's never been more demand for content. Yet we can't get people to pay for it or pay for quality journalism. Let's pick on what you pick up on what you were wanting to talk about. How we're actually the, the models and, and how you know uh, the US, for example, has a much better uh, system yeah. of philanthropy and you know big donors putting money into independent organisations. Sure. In a in a perfect world, what might happen here? Michael West would, of course, become a very influential, <laughs> but, but, but really, how can we figure this out? Yes, we'd, we'd grow a rate of knots. So we'd have to clone him, of course, because <laughs> there aren't many like Michael West, I have to say, in Australia at, this mo at the very moment. But um, the, what I was going to talk about was, uh, in the US, I think last count, I, there was something like 150 not-for-profit media organisations. So under their IRS law, you can qualify for charitable status and DGR status, which is designated gift recipients. So if you donate to that media organisation, you get, a, you get a tax deduction, right? So in the US, as I said last count, this was for a submission for the Senate inquiry on this last year. I think I counted up 150 of these organisations. Now, to get the qualification, you have to be, you don't have to be an educational institute, which unfortunately is the qualification here to, to get charitable status. So no media organisation can get it. The conversation do, because they're, they're universities. But in the US, you just have to, your product has to be educational, right? So it's very different. Uh, and th these not-for-profits, they have to do genuine fact-based investigative <coughs> journalism. I mean, to borrow, I, mean, I hate the fact that he's stolen, that he's made this slogan his now, but I was going to say, how good is that? But um, <laughs> <laughs> not, no, I can't use it anymore. But the thing, the thing about this is, you know, you look at, look at um, I recommend you read ProPublica, for example, multiple um, award-winning site, is one of these. Now, they've, they've got all these fabulous investigative journalists and they syndicate. They actually share their investigations with New York Times and Washington Post. Who would have thought major mastheads, biggest in the world, you know, the most revered, <coughs> taking investigations from these smaller organisations? That's, that's what's happened in the US. The media in the US so people are much more switched on about this kind of stuff because they're getting the right information and they're looking for it. But we don't have it here. I can't see it happening under the current government. We tried last year with a Senate inquiry, but that's what we need because otherwise, um, you know, organisations like ours, I mean, we, we struggle, but if there were, you know, we were able to offer designated gift recipient status, so you get a tax deduction, you know, so much e easier it would be for us. Um, yeah, so that's about it really. So that's uh, something we can keep campaigning for.